This podcast is sponsored by A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London and Middlesex, both family owned and operated. By Hyde Park Care Pharmacy. Experience the difference an independent pharmacy can make for you and your loved ones. Hyde Park Care Pharmacy offers personalized care, short wait time, very competitive pricing, easy transfer of your prescription, and much more. And by Molly Maid. During these times of COVID-19, it has never been more important to keep your family safe. With the healthy home cleaning system, Molly Maid London is here to help. Make your home a healthy haven. Call Molly Maid London today. In this episode, we are excited to sit down with celebrated spiritual writer and sought-after speaker, Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove. In his new book, Revolution of Values, Jonathan outlines how Christians have misused scripture to consolidate power, stoke fears, and defend against enemies. A solution to this rests with people who have been hurt by the attacks of Christian nationalism. Jonathan shows us how their voices can help us rediscover God's vision for faith in public life. We discuss people on the front lines of issues ranging from immigration policy and voting rights to women's rights and much more. This is a conversation that certainly helps us focus on striving to respect the dignity of every human being. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever and wherever you may be listening. We welcome you back to another edition of the Vickers Crossing podcast. The Vickers Crossing is a virtual space where faith intersects with the public square. And my name is Rob Henderson, and I'm the priest and serve at Holy Trinity St. Stephen's Anglican Church in London, Ontario. And my name is Kevin George. I'm the priest at St. Aidan's Anglican Church, and I got a nice new mask. Hope that they ah, have. yeah, nice. The Vickers Crossing. I mean, nice. You can get these. You can get these by being in touch with us. But anyway, that's who I am, and I'm hanging out at St. Aidan's Church, and I have another friend on, on the screen, too. <laughs> my name is Ian. I'm a singer, songwriter, producer, and the, and the person who gets this out to your ear holes. Very good. And, and, and. <laughs> <laughs> whose mug is on a mug ian your mug's on a mug we're all on a mug look at that look at that that's great you can get mugs too kevin you can get masks mugs the whole you thing. can get but, mugs mm. but you won't get mugged ah mm, very, very good important, very, very important good. distinction yes well welcome everybody we're glad you're here today we're excited to be visiting with a very special guest celebrated spiritual writer and sought after speaker Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove will be on the podcast today, and we'll be discussing faith in the public square and hear a bit more about his recent book, which is titled Revolution of Values. Great book. Uh, in the meantime, though, while we get ready for that, we're going to acknowledge that the uh, Vickers Crossing podcast is recorded on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Lenapeawak, and Attawandaran peoples on the lands connected with the London Township and Somber Treaties and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. This land continues to be home to diverse Indigenous peoples, Inuit, Métis, and First Nations, whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of this land and vital contributors to our society and people with whom we wish to work to move towards reconciliation. And before we uh, invite Jonathan into the Vickers Crossing, we want to say thank you and hello once again to our wonderful sponsors, first to A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London Middlesex, both family-owned and operated. Hello to Dave Mullen. Thank you for all your support, and we say hi to all the folks today at A. Miller George. Yes, and to Carol Basada from uh, Hyde Park Care Pharmacy, locally owned, locally operated, and locally loved. Go see Carol and get your drugs. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, a huge thank you to Molly Maid. Make your home a healthy haven call. Molly Maid London today. And Trisha Lister was the wonderful human being out there who hooked us up with that one. So thank you to them over there. All right. Very good. And uh, hey, Kevin, you know, we've been having some great guests here on the Vickers Crossing over the last few weeks. So we know we have more coming up. So we at do. this time. Well, no, this, just, oh, be, just before that, if we can, Oh yeah. I just opened an envelope just before we went on the air. And, uh, and so for those of you who are not on YouTube, you won't see this, but I'll describe it in the envelope was this card. And this is, I'll let you see if you can read it here. And Rob can read it to the listeners. Uh, I can't really see it. Sorry. Oh, oh Kev, there it is. It's Kevin, Rob, and Ian. Thank you so much for inviting me uh, on your podcast. It was a delight. 
best Kate now. That Kate wouldn't Bowler. be Kate Bowler, would it? That's wow. Kate Bowler, and she sent us some lovely stickers, which I'll share with you guys. Oh, life is so beautiful. Life is so hard. And awesome. Uh, you read the next one, Ian. No cure for being human. In this lovely mm-hmm. sticker. And then this one here, uh, I'll read. It says, uh, human again today. So uh, these are some stickers and a card. And uh, thank you, nice. Kate. You are awesome. And we're so Heck glad yeah. to hear the book sales are going well. Fantastic. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Kate. That's yeah. nice. That's so nice. To, Thank you so much to have that. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Kate was a wonderful guest and we have more coming up. So at this time, we would like to uh, present to you, ladies and gentlemen, on the Vickers Crossing podcast, a segment we like to call, hey, Kevin, who in the world did we book this week? Oh, funny you should ask. Drum roll, please. <laughs> okay, that's enough. Um <laughs> Heidi Newmark. Now, Heidi Newmark is author, pastor, speaker. At um, She's a Lutheran pastor who served congregations in the South Bronx. Presently, she's in Manhattan. Uh, I was really moved uh, by, uh, by one of her earlier books. She has a new book out now, uh, which is called um, Sanctuary. And we're going to love to talk about that. But uh, she's, she's just an amazing person and will be an amazing guest. And so you can look for her in November. Very good. And uh, again, we just want to remind everybody that if you go onto our website, thevickerscrossing.com, you will find information about the authors and uh, links to many of the books that we discuss here on the podcast. And you will also be able to find out how you can get yourself a hold of some Vickers Crossing swag, like the mugs that we mentioned and the masks that just came in and wonderful water bottles that are new to the Vickers Crossing podcast as well. So uh, look on there and you can make your order through the website and thank you in advance for your support. We hope you enjoy that. Awesome. Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove is our guest today and his book is Revolution of Values and he is going to be coming in here in just a second. So let's bring Jonathan in guys. Come on in Jonathan. Woo. And we are back and so happy to welcome our guests to the Vickers Crossing podcast today. Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove is with us and we're here to talk about his book, Revolution of Values and a whole bunch of other good things too, I know. So Jonathan, welcome. Glad you could be part of our podcast today. Well, thanks for having me. Good to be with you. Yeah. Let's... Now tell, tell our listeners whereabouts you are so we can get a handle on you here. Well, as you may can hear, I'm not from London, Ontario. Uh, <laughs> Thank your stars. Thank your stars, Jonathan. <laughs> from the American South, uh, I grew up uh, not too far from Mayberry. If anybody's ever oh, seen yeah. any of the show, oh, of course, that was, yeah, that was yeah. a fictionalized version of my granny's hometown. Oh, and uh, I live about uh, 100 miles east of there now, in wow. Durham, North Carolina. Wow, fantastic. good for you. That's fantastic. Good. Is it is it is it like warm and hot today? It's right nice. I've got the window up. Uh it's uh 70 or so Fahrenheit. It's fantastic. Oh, nice. yeah. Good. This is good. 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 When are we going to Durham, boys? We need to go. Yeah, we need a road trip. We're I don't not know. Allowed, we, we're not I, allowed I don't know. I got to. yeah, I got two different types of vaccinations. So I don't know if I'm allowed over there yet. We don't know if we're allowed <laughs> so in. to figure that out. We're taking you all up here, as you guys would say. We're bringing you all in here, but we're not yeah. allowed in there yet. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I hear it's coming soon. I think That's November right. it's opening November. the world, but I'm yeah. I'm grateful to the Canadians. They let me and my family in to see <laughs> to see my wife's uh, uh family. Oh, do they live here in Canada? Yeah, we were on Vancouver Island earlier, uh, end of the summer. Awesome. Awesome. Good for you. That's great. Well, just uh, I wonder if we can ask to sort of give people uh, a a place you a little bit in terms of some of the work that you're doing, because your webpage says that you live at uh, Rutba House in in North Carolina, and that you're you're the director of the School of Conversion. Now, that gets people all excited. And uh, and that you're on the steering committee, of course, with... uh, uh, the poor people's campaign and uh, help the Canadians understand a little bit about these three really incredible parts of your life and your journey, the, the uh, Rupa house and the school of conversion and the people's uh, poor people's campaign. Yeah. Well, my right life is rooted here in a hospitality house. It's called the Rupa house. It's named after a village in Iraq that offered us hospitality when we were there with the Christian peacemaker teams in 2003 our country was bombing them and our friends were in an accident there, nearly died. And the uh, doctor said to them, uh, three days ago, your country bombed our hospital, but we'll take care of you. And mm-hmm. he saved their lives. Uh, wow. So we've been trying to practice 
we just been trying to grow up into that kind of hospitality, I guess, for wow. the last couple of decades. Yeah. Um, and uh, out of our life here, which is, a, you know, uh, a life where we've had the chance to meet a lot of people coming home from prison, people coming, uh, you know, bankrupted by our uh, medical system here, uh, mm -hmm. people who don't have a home for various reasons have lived here. It's been a kind of introduction to see the world from their perspective. And, um, and that's the kind of uh, school for conversion we've tried to uh, start here. It's, a, it's really a popular education center in the tradition of folk schools and, and those, those kind of places where uh, people who are trying to uh, change the world uh, have a chance to gather together and to get resourced. Um, uh, you know, people don't really need uh, a, a degree to uh, do a lot of what's needed in the world, but often, you know, need to be connected with other folks and, and to be rooted in, you know, a tradition of uh, resistance and, and of uh, faith-rooted organizing. So we do that at the School for Conversion. We say we make surprising friendships possible. That's our mission. That's uh, to bring awesome. People together in that oh, space. Yeah, that's wonderful. And our, a lot of our work these days is with the Poor People's Campaign, which is a movement in uh, the United States to build a fusion coalition across the various lines that divide our society uh, to really try to um, make our uh, uh, system that doesn't work for a lot of people work for more people. Um, we sort of believe that uh, if everybody does better, everybody will do better. And that if we lift from the bottom, uh, everybody will rise. And so mm -hmm. that's a, a people's movement that's um, bringing together folks who are working on lots of different issues, grassroots movements and communities across the country and uh, trying to um, uh, advocate together for a moral agenda in public life. Wow. Well, yeah, and, and the work is incredible. And of course, we'll uh, ask you a little bit more about Reverend Barber later on in the podcast and the work that he's doing. And um, But uh, I just, I mean, I've been following you for a while, reading the books and, and the work that you've done together with Reverend Barber. And I just think your own personal journey is such a, a great testimony to the fact that God is able to move us all into different and, and profound places. I read somewhere in, in, um, in your description of your early life arriving on Capitol Hill, mm -hmm. uh, that you, you came there uh, in, in Washington in the 1990s, you described yourself as a young Christian excited to serve as a Strom Thurmond's page. Um, and the first thing Thurmond did was warn you about black people in Washington, DC. Um, now you said that while you were no doubt uh, you know, you probably came with your own racist ideas and that racism had been part of the air that you breathe. You realize that um, that sort of blanket description of black people is a dangerous thing. Uh, you've written and also spoken heavily about the influence of activist Anne Atwater on your journey. Um, so from being that page for S Strom Thurmond uh, to who you are today, standing shoulder to shoulder with this incredibly, you know, powerful man in, 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 uh, in Reverend William Barber. I wonder for listeners outside the US if you can, um, who might be a little less familiar with Strom and Thurman and what he was up to and what he was about, can you share some about this remarkable journey of yours from being a young page for a staunch segregationist to being um, the activist follower of Jesus you are today? Well, uh, yeah, it's, it's certainly been um, a journey, one that I'm quite grateful for and I think is full of grace um, God's grace certainly but manifests through people um, for folks who don't know uh, I mean Strom Thurmond uh, is a, an interesting character because his political career spanned uh, the pre-civil rights movement the civil rights movement and then the post civil rights America and uh, because of that I think you can see uh, in his political career how some of the uh, um, political forces of white supremacy uh, reformed themselves and uh, you know um, reorganized in different ways. So he ran as the Dixiecrat candidate for president in 1948. So you know um, the sort of person who, like George Wallace and others who were famous at that time for being defiant segregationists, I mean, he he was a leader among those. Um, but then uh, you know after he had filibustered the civil rights bill on the Senate floor as a U.S. Senator. Um, he actually led the Southern Democrats into the Republican Party and uh, uh, um, sort of realigned um, 
the explicitly racist politics of the South uh, as a uh, um, what they call the Southern strategy. So mm -hmm. uh, a way of uh, maintaining a white voter base without explicitly appealing to racism. And particularly for me as a Christian, um, what I have had to come to learn is that a lot of that transition was about uh, appealing to people not uh, on the basis of their racial identity, but on the basis of their Christian identity and mm -hmm. their so-called traditional values. Um, so I, I was, you know, part of a white community, white Christian community that was targeted with that messaging in the 80s and 90s, and I wanted to do everything I could for Jesus. So I grew up wanting to be a Republican politician, and that's why I went to work for Strom Thurmond. And it was in his office and in the context of sort of seeing up close how um, right wing, uh, religious right, conservative uh, Christian politics worked on Capitol Hill that I realized that there, there was a pretty uh, deep divide between the values that were actually being pursued and practiced in that life and what, what the Sunday school teachers had taught me back home <laughs> at the Baptist church. So, so that tension was the beginning of my uh, conversion, um, which is an ongoing conversion for sure, but has been helped along by uh, many folks who taught me to uh, follow Jesus and to practice my faith in public in, in different ways. And um, certainly uh, Reverend Barber was uh, right there at the very beginning to introduce me to that tradition when I came back home as a teenager still from being a page on Capitol Hill. Uh, he welcomed me into his church and uh, started teaching me um, another uh, tradition of faith in public life, uh, one that I knew very little about, but that he had inherited from his parents and generations before them. I, I refer to it often as the, the Black-led freedom struggle in the American South. Hey, hey, can you say a little bit about Ann Atwater? Yeah, so when we moved to Durham uh, in 2003, after that experience I described earlier in Iraq, we started the Rootba House here and we began getting to know this uh, community and uh, Ann Atwater was one of the veterans of the civil rights movement in this community. She had, um, she had been among the most militant uh, community-based activists in the South during the civil rights era and the black power era that followed it. And in 1971, an interesting thing happened. They still hadn't um, desegregated our public schools. So uh, they sent a federal agent in to facilitate that process. And he had this idea that the only way you could get the town together and get the town to agree on a plan for desegregation was to get everybody that is, you know, all the factions uh, in the room. And the way to get all the factions in the room, he believed, was to have the polar opposites lead the process. Mm. So he asked uh, Ann to lead the process with the guy who was at the time the head of the Ku Klux Klan here, wow. um, which was, you know, pretty uh, bold move and uh, almost didn't happen, but it, it did because he told each of them, you know, if you don't do it, then I'll let the other one lead it. And, you know, even though they had each literally tried to uh, kill one another before, um, they decided that uh, they, they didn't want the other one to be in charge of the process. So they worked together. And in the process of working together, um, I think they recognized that they had some things in common, namely that they were both poor and that their kids uh, were in poor schools and weren't doing well in the uh, poor white schools or in the poor black schools. And so um, it's a pretty dramatic story. Uh, it's It's been told in a movie called The Best of Enemies. Um, but uh, at the end of that process, the the fellow who had led the Klan actually tore up his Klan card and said, uh, wow. if this keeps if this keeps me from working with Ann Atwater, you know, I, I don't want it anymore. And so they um, they organized in this town together for the rest of their lives. And um, when we came here, uh, CP was at the end of his life, but Anne was still quite active. And um, she mentored us in, in uh, the community organizing that she was doing. And then uh, she taught together uh, with me at the School for Conversion for about the last decade of her life. So she was a great teacher and uh, friend and, mm -hmm. and really adopted us into her family. She, she became grandma and our kids. Awesome. That's yeah. great. Great gift to have her in your life for sure. Hey, you want to get into the book a little bit if we could. Um, Revolution of Values is, is the title. And um, Kevin and I are, are priests in the Anglican Church, the Episcopal Church in, in the U.S. And, uh -huh. and so we love our sacraments. So I was really happy to, uh, to read in the beginning 
your uh, description of baptism when you kind of get yeah. into that at the beginning. Um, and so I wanted to ask you a bit about that. You bring us um, at the beginning of your book to the U.S.-Mexico border. And the story that you share is a reunification of a woman with her family uh, mm. in the river. And it sets a real powerful tone for the book. Wondering if you could share with our listeners some of that story and perhaps a little of your reaction to to really the continued uh, devastating images that we often see at the southern border right now. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, it was a powerful experience. And it happened when uh, Reverend Barber and I and others, uh, Reverend Liz Theo Harris, uh, folks who were involved in relaunching the Poor People's Campaign in 2018, we spent a couple of years before that uh, traveling around the country and meeting with folks who were engaged in um, justice struggles in their communities and people who we thought might want to join a coalition of people to, to work together for systemic change. And the folks down there in Texas are part of the border network for human rights. They invited us to come down and, um, and they wanted us to be there for this uh, uh, event they were having at the time. This was during the Trump administration early on. And um, they called it uh, Hugs Not Walls. Mm -hmm. And the uh, experience was, it was on Sunday morning, uh, you know, when many folks were on their way to church. And um, they invited us to come down to the river. Uh, Maria, the woman who I went with, uh, was going to meet her husband who had been deported recently and uh, her two sons, uh, one of whom she had not seen in over 15 years. And um, uh, the, this had been negotiated with the Border Patrol because they developed a relationship with the Border Patrol and um, the network did. And you know, this is how advocacy works. You have to you have to have a relationship with the people who are, you know, in charge of enforcing whatever system you want to change or right. challenge. And so they, uh, they said to them, you know, as we understand it, your job is to make sure that people from this side don't, you know, get across over there and people from that side don't get across over here without authorization. And they said, yeah, that's our job. And they said, well, where's the line? And they said, what do you mean? And they said, like, literally, where's the line? Like, where's the line that you could stand on and talk to one another, you know, if, as long as you didn't go yes. to the other side and they said well it's in the middle of that river and um they said well we've got family on the other side that we can't see if we could uh if we could meet them in the middle of the river could we you know could we meet and then come back each to our respective sides and uh, the border patrol agreed to start doing this so so maria invited us to go with her and to uh we literally had to wade uh wade you know, in the water yeah, into the water. Yeah, right. that's that was awesome. Yeah. Uh, Miss Yara Allen, who's a great song leader, was with us, and she she was singing that as we went out. Uh, it's quite muddy, so it was a slow walk, you know, <laughs> trying to make sure you don't fall over. Yeah, getting in there, um, but we got up on this little sandbar in the middle, and uh, we're there for that reunion. And uh, after we came out of the water, uh, we were walking back up the uh, embankment on the other side, and I looked back to the Mexican side, and someone has put in these rocks uh they, they spelled out in big you know letters on the side of the mountain with rocks um the bible is the word of god uh uh read it <laughs> <laughs> but, you know i assume i assume yeah. there's some you know very committed evangelical who won't be i would say yeah. so yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. but yeah. i uh but i saw that after coming out of the out of the waters and i felt like uh you know the bible has a lot to say about um you know, families that wander, uh, mm -hmm. you know, without a home and how God invites us to be family. And it, it felt to me like um, it was kind of a word from the Lord that Maria is my sister and that she, mm -hmm. she and her family have been divided by um, policies that really need to be changed. And so right. yeah. uh, it's part of my work to, uh, to join her in that struggle. So I did feel like it was a, it was a baptism that they invited mm -hmm. us into, a kind of yeah. baptism into their struggle. Oh, very much so. Very powerful image for sure. And, um, you know, there's a lot of hope in, in your book as you tell stories like, like that one and other stories of those who are also doing um, some great work of discipleship. And uh, one of the people you write about is uh, Julia Dinsmore, and you quote her um, having said this, privilege has convinced people they already know everything and should therefore be imparting themselves on everyone else. Yeah, it seems to me that this certainly is a problem that plagues our current culture. Um, I wonder if you could tell us more about 
about Julia and, and why hearing, you know, the Bible through her voice is so critical right now. Oh, Julia Dinsmore is a, a, a beautiful sister and a wonderful teacher. Um, and in so many ways, she represents uh, what I wanted to do with this book, which is, which is to show how, uh, you know, in all of these, you know, faith-rooted struggles for justice that uh, I've been invited into around this country, mm-hmm. that, um, that there is this kind of uh, reading of the text that, uh, that, that sets it in a different light and that helps us see, I think, uh, the scriptures much more from the perspective of the people that they were originally written to. Um, I mean, uh, uh, this is true for Americans and Canadians. We are, uh, we are living, you know, um, I laugh sometimes with my Canadian friends, because, you know, when you travel outside of North America, uh, it's gotten to be kind of dangerous to be an American in some parts of the world. So sometimes my, uh, <laughs> my American friends will put a little Canadian flag, you know, on their bag if they, yeah, yeah, they don't want to, yeah, yeah. you know, they don't want to come across as an American, they'll pretend to be a Canadian. <laughs> but I tell my Canadian friends, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's the sort of a uh, perfect privilege to be a Canadian, you get most of the benefits of advanced capitalism and the yeah. way it's exploited the world without getting most of the blame. <laughs> <laughs> Not to say we don't share it, by the way. I mean, no, no, no. like, you yeah. know, what, what, what we got going on here racially with uh, First Nations and everything else. I mean, you know, like that's the interesting part of that, right? Is, is it a perception and reality or? That's right. Wow. It's, it's definitely a perception thing. I think we're I think we're probably equally enmeshed in settler colonialism and all the ways that that has uh, uh, affected the world through plantation capitalism. Yeah. Uh, it, that's rooted in the South, but it's certainly been uh, developed quite uh, extensively in Canada. At any rate, uh, we often in our churches in both of these places, the U.S. and Canada, we, we, we often assume that you know we can understand the scriptures uh, as, as people in this position of, you know, uh, being kind of comfortable middle class resource people who look at the world and understand its problems and try to you know do what we can to help out or offer some relief when as a matter of fact you know the the whole story of scripture is kind of the story of a a caravan of migrants who you know never really belonged or had much power anywhere where they were whether it was egypt or babylon or i mean even as a little uh uh nation in Israel, you know, certainly not a empire. It was often occupied by some somebody else. Mm-hmm. And the Jesus movement, you know, is on the fringes. Jesus is crucified as an enemy of the state. And, you know, this movement has to be underground for most of the history that's recorded in the text. So in all of that, you know, the, the, the scriptures are written to a people who are marginalized, the people who are trying to uh, hold on to good news and uh, uh, believe that God is for them in the midst of uh, pretty extreme circumstances. And I think what I've learned is that when you get alongside people who are struggling for justice in this world, um, uh, those, those stories come alive. And uh, Ju- Julia is a great example of that. She's a, a poor white woman from Minnesota who has uh, uh, really challenged uh, the church in Minnesota to recognize the ways that it ignores the wisdom of the poor when it's an institution that... Uh, that was 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 founded uh, basically upon the wisdom of the poor. Yeah, right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Blessed are the poor. The kingdom yeah. belongs to you. Oh, exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. We, she's she's an amazing. Sorry, I was just going to say she's an amazing example. What you've written about her is really touching. And again, these folks are prophetic. Like it, it, and when we come alongside that, and we hear what I like about the book is is this constant reminder to hear the scripture through those voices, which I right. think is critical. Sorry, Ian. It's okay. You, it's okay. Just real quickly for your listeners, if you've never heard Julia's poem, My Name Is Not Those People, you can just uh, type that into YouTube. There's a version of it Danny Glover reads uh, that'll pop right up. My Name Is Not Those People it is a great articulation of her wisdom. She wrote that poem years ago, and it's, it's gone all around the world. Awesome. Nice. Uh, we recently saw the power of what one faithful woman could do in Georgia when Stacey Abrams mobilized the force, uh, ro- mobilized the vote, vote, sorry, during the 2020 presidential election. Mm-hmm. Um, your book tells a story of Rosenel, Rosenel Eaton, excuse me, and the contributions she made to giving African-Americans access to the ballot. 
Um, both of these women were motivated by faith. Um, the voter suppression laws we are hearing about across America right now are like honestly very frightening. Um, it would appear that people like Stacey Abrams and Rosanelle uh, Eaton have put the religious right in a state of panic. Uh, can you tell us about Rosanelle's activism, which stretched right into her 90s? Yes, indeed. Uh, yeah. Both of those women would be quick to say that, uh, you know, all of their efforts were coalition efforts, for sure. Yes, they would. Um, yeah. I mean, they, they, they are certainly leaders and certainly visionaries in their own right. But, uh, but I mean, they, 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 their brilliance is in part that they, they really saw how and, and see, I mean, I think Stacey Abrams is continuing to do great work in terms of helping people see that you build power for the people who are excluded and marginalized by building organization that, you know, includes thousands and tens of thousands of people who are engaged in this process. And, um, yes. and that's what, uh, that's what Miss Rosendale did. She, she was here in North Carolina. That's where I got to know her. Uh, and she had, uh, during the Jim Crow era, she had gone to the um, registrar in her county and had, uh, uh, as the law required at the time, had quoted the preamble to the U.S. Constitution uh, in order to prove that she was worthy you know, to vote. But once she broke through and you know, got over that hurdle that was put in place to keep people like her from voting, uh, she went on to register, uh, I think, over 4,000 people uh, to vote in her lifetime. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, I mean, that's certainly important, but she, she, she worked with others to build a, uh, a movement that was really focused on expanding access to the ballot. And, um, and what that did was that made the possibility here in North Carolina for a coalition that could uh, change the balance of power. Uh, a lot of this pushback against voting rights is, um, is a pushback against the uh, voting rights expansion that we won in North Carolina in 2006 and 2007 mm -hmm. um, that expanded early voting that made it easier for people to register uh, as, as young people are coming into the system. Um, the, these, the, you know, if you're a working person and you have a, a, a shift that lasts the whole 12 hours of voting on election day, how are you, how are you going to vote on that Tuesday? I mean, we don't, you know, we don't vote on the weekends here. We vote on a Tuesday in November. Yeah. And um, the, so this expansion of early voting and having weekend voting when people can even go from their churches to vote together. Uh, we've had these souls to the polls rally that really created a, a, an expansion, especially an expansion of African American voting in North Carolina in 2008. And that's why Barack Obama won this state in 2008. Uh, he lost the state on election day. But after they tallied all of those early votes that had come in in the two weeks prior to election day, uh, he won the state and that put people in a panic. Uh, as you were saying, um, uh, that panic has only increased mm -hmm. because of the um, diversifying electorate in this country. And so now there are pretty explicit voter suppression measures um, that are uh, that have gone through state houses this year and uh, that are, are, are still in the process in some. Um, it's really become an official position of the Republican Party in the United States that uh, they want to make it more difficult for people to vote. And uh, it's pretty clear that the reason for that is that when more people vote, uh, there um, is less support for the very pro-corporate agenda that, that, um, that they have backed for some time. So, um, so yeah, it, it's, it, it shouldn't be a partisan thing. Uh, to say that everyone should be able to vote, and yet uh, it has become uh, a real sticking point for one party in this country that uh, that they're committed to making it more difficult for people to vote. So it right up to the present right now, it's a, it's a huge issue in our U.S. Yeah. Senate because we have the opportunity to pass something called the For the People Act uh, if all of the Democrats in the Senate would vote for it. Uh, unfortunately, they're dragging their feet and are, are not willing to break the filibuster to do that. And what that means is that the redistricting process that's already underway, it happens after our census every 10 years, the state legislatures get to redistrict and the uh, ones that are controlled by Republicans who really wanna make it more difficult for people to vote so they can hang on to power, uh, those states are gerrymandering the congressional right. districts already mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, they can choose districts that will be more Republican uh, going into the 2024 midterms. Wow. 
Yeah, I once looked at the geography of some of those. Like, it's shocking the way they've drawn these maps and yeah. they've gerrymandered these. I, I, I give uh, another question here, but before I get to it, just to uh, follow up on that, I guess, how do you, f what do you see in, in the, um, in the Christian response, so I suppose we hear a lot from the the Christian right, or you know, we've we've muddied the word the, the the word evangelical, right? So we've 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 dirtied that up. But but the, I mean, the people, a large part of the support for Trump and, and the coalition that he built yeah. uh, was was evangelical right wing Christianity. Yeah. How do they square this in in terms of a faith response to removing people's access? to the balance like it's shocking to me that you can you can hold you know the the idea that those who've been marginalized and are vulnerable should be raised up on one hand and then yeah. on the other hand say let's do what we can to make sure they can't vote well um it's a long story it's the other story that i tell in this book uh, i i really want to lift up the story of you know people who are reading the scriptures as a real inspiration and guide in the struggle for justice but I hold that alongside this 40 year story of how um, the shift that happened in the United States was, I mean, if you go back mid 20th century in the United States, um, it was pretty broadly recognized that um, policies that lift up the poor, policies that create greater equity, you know, civil rights uh, were moral issues. And certainly not everyone agreed on exactly how those things should happen. There were mm -hmm. political differences and that kind of thing. But, but you know, when people saw Dr. King and the Catholic sisters in Selma and Abraham Joshua Heschel and others marching, that, that there was a pretty wide recognition that these were moral issues and that uh, the church certainly had um, some stake in um, uh, being there and, be, you know, and, and seeing these, um, these justice issues advanced. Um, the pushback against that began in the 1970s, and it uh, was orchestrated uh, in large part by a guy named Paul Weyrich, who worked to build um, some uh, funding streams that would create a kind of a way for uh, really well-to-do corporate interests to put a lot of money into politics and into the culture around yeah. shaping political views, but also connecting that with what we call in the States now the religious right, connecting it with um, uh, Christian leaders who would represent that in public life. So Jerry Falwell is the kind of first mm -hmm. person he reached out to. And, uh, and it began with, you know, people like him, conservative Baptists in the U.S., but they have really continued to build and build this as a, it's not just evangelicals, um, but it, it, it's certainly uh, uh, often talked about as white evangelicals. It's, uh, there's a quite a bit of outreach to Catholics, um, yes. to Hispanic Christians. Uh, to uh, Jews in the United States, um, I mean that's it's 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 a pretty huge operation, yeah. and all of that has been about convincing those constituencies that holding on to power, uh, usually in the name of um, holding on to their cultural values and protecting those cultural values, is a righteous cause. And so I think for most people in that position. Uh, the cause in their imagination is so righteous that any means that you might use to advance the cause is legitimate. And so, you know, um, they don't think about it as voter suppression. They always call it voter, you know, integrity measures. And they, uh, they don't think about it as making it harder to vote. They yeah. think about it as making sure voting is secure. Um, but in the process of doing so, if it means 30 or 40,000 people in a state, you know, um, are excluded or purged from the rolls or might not have an opportunity to vote next time. Yeah. I think they really consider that the price they're willing to pay uh, because they so believe that this uh, current Republican party represents their values. Now, Donald Trump did not create any of that. Like I'm oh, saying no. that that's been there for some time, yeah. but I, I do think that uh, his sort of uh, uh, hucksterism, I mean, his, you know, b being a TV salesman, um, he, he, he understood that and has uh, been marketing it quite uh, explicitly and in this kind of, you know, social media culture where sure. everybody, you know, jumps into a fight and takes a side. Um, I think he's become a champion for that kind of polarizing rhetoric. Yeah, they were more than happy to embrace him in the middle of that, too, which is his own shock. Right. So whatever means necessary, I guess. Right. Yeah. But again, you know, it's 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 a small yeah. price to pay if you can win in their in their mind yeah true so the extension of, of one of the conversations in your book too is about um, law and order and um 
and you, you write very well about sort of the, um, the outflow of uh, uh, Black Lives Matter, the demonstrations that happened all across, not just the United States, but across the world after the murder of George Floyd mm-hmm. uh, Bri- and Breonna Taylor and, and, and others. And, um, you know, again, one of the, one of the uh, sort of most vocal proponents of what we were just talking about nowadays, of course, Franklin Graham. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so you quote Franklin Graham as having said, in the wake of those demonstrations, listen up blacks, he says, whites, Latinos, and everyone else. Most police shootings can be avoided. It comes down to respect for authority and obedience. If a police officer tells you to stop, you stop. If a police officer tells you to put your hands in the air, you put your hands in the air. If a police officer tells you to lay down face first with your hands behind your back, you lay down face first with your hands behind your back. It's as simple as that. You go on to write, while Franklin Graham's personal circumstances are unique, Graham's way of seeing the world is not. A society that was set up by white men constantly rewards white men when they submit to the established authorities within it. In turn, white men often see the established order in which they succeed as natural. I'm a white man too, you write. Wherever, uh, whenever I thank God for the success of my life, I have to grapple with how my gratitude can easily become a justification for the systems that order our shared life, sanctifying a quote-unquote biblical worldview in which respect is honored with rewards and adversity is a sign of punishment for disobedience. Can Mm -hmm. you talk to us about reading the Bible with the condemned uh, uh, as a, as a lens and also about what you write in that chapter about mass incarceration and how to deal with that? Yeah, I I think it's a critically important part of our uh, history. There's a great historian at Yale uh, here in the U S her name's Elizabeth Hinton. Mm -hmm. I was just, um, talking to her last week, she wrote a book called uh, From the War on Poverty to the War on Crime that Mm. chronicles this period in our history. But, you know, in in some, um, what happened uh, after the civil rights movement was that the people who didn't want to see the system that had been challenged by the movement change Mm -hmm. um, decided to uh, criminalize uh, you know, the people who had been marginalized by the system and to say that it, was, it wasn't a failure of the system, uh, but it was rather personal failures that, um, you know, had, had made people poor. Uh, so that criminalization of the poor that targeted, you know, a war on drugs in poor, mostly black and brown neighborhoods in the United States started filling our prisons with black and brown people who were then, you know, under a sort of surveillance system that was always watching uh, to you know figure out what they were doing wrong um, and, and and that had you know all kinds of collateral consequences even when you get out of it right so you've if you've been to prison then you're you're, you're uh, you know have an even harder time getting a job getting continuing education getting housing um, mm-hmm. all of that complex uh, of, of, of issues is is what um, we usually mean when we refer to law and order but from the perspective of the way it was pitched to many uh, white Christians and white conservatives in the United States, it was this kind of a uh, uh, sense that, well, doesn't the Bible say that you ought to respect authority? Uh, you know, doesn't God ordain the authorities that exist to do? Well, well, I mean, you can read Romans 13, yes. um, but you can't read it without some awareness that even as, you know, Paul is talking about submitting to the authorities, He's actively challenging those. Authorities. He's in prison. He's in prison. <laughs> yes. He is himself incarcerated. So if you don't blame the incarcerated for being incarcerated, then at some point your blame's got to get back to Brother Paul. That's right. Yeah. And, uh, I think the logic of the law and order, you know, in terms of how we read the scripture, breaks down at that point, um, because uh, Brother Paul believes, yes, you know, he's submitting to the earthly authorities because he knows a greater authority, and that authority is going to set uh, the world right, and so he can have patience. But that. But that in no way justifies uh, what those corrupt and unjust authorities are doing. Um, We've been watching now uh, from Texas. There's a big fight going on right now in Texas over abortion rights. We had a guest on the podcast a little while back, uh, Reverend Jen Butler joined us. And she pointed out that the law that was passed in Texas is quite uh, draconian and has raised the ire of some who are uh, pro-life as well as those who are pro-choice. Yeah. You have uh, quite a compelling chapter in your book about the fight for women's rights and the impact of a world ordered by, uh, quote unquote, godly men. 
Mm. Um, you quote 19th century feminist and abolitionist uh, Sojourner Truth, who asked the 1851 Women's Convention in Ohio, uh, where did your Christ come from? From God and a woman. Man had nothing to do with him. I love it. I love that. Yeah, I love that. And, and you go on to say, that. yeah, that's yeah. right, exactly. You can't yeah. argue with that. Um, you go on to say, not only did Jesus come through a woman to dwell among us, he also entrusted his gospel to women, mm -hmm. sending them from the empty tomb to share the good news of his resurrection with male disciples who had gone into hiding after their Messiah mm -hmm. was executed. Thankfully, no defender of family values was there in the first century <laughs> Palestine to tell the women at the tomb that uh, instructing Peter, James, and John about what they had heard and seen would be unbiblical. <laughs> love that. Um, Fantastic. Love that too, yeah. Uh, could you say more, Jonathan, about you know the family values movement and, and maybe a bit about the impact that it has had on women's rights in America? Well, you know, I've, I've talked already about how the pushback in terms of the organized effort to uh, resist the gains of the civil rights movement, you know, was targeted at those kind of uh, racial justice issues. But it, it is important to say that, you know, tied up with those and uh, re really in the same moment, they were also fighting against the women's rights movement. Uh, yeah. I mean, the Equal Rights Amendment uh, passed Congress and uh, would have been ratified by the states in the United States had it not been for this sort of all out effort uh, to uh, weaponize uh, what the um, folks who wanted to uh, defend um, the system as it existed, you know, what they called uh, the traditional family. Mm -hmm. And uh, Phyllis Shafley was, you know, the leader of the Stop ERA movement. But, um, but, but, but all of that, I think, was an, an effort to uh, create this kind of uh, culture war, right, yes. where people could... Um, could argue about these cultural uh, differences uh, in a way that would distract from the, I think, larger um, political issues that uh, at least the people who were funding all of this really cared about. Uh, and so it set up, it set up the um, the history that uh, I think Randall Balmer has written well about in terms of how the religious right grew out of uh, this uh, pretty explicitly racist and I think. Uh, uh, um, anti-women um, political uh, reaction uh, that was in the country at the time, and yet re re really, really tried to organize that around, uh, you know, uh, not not resisting civil rights or resisting women's rights, but organize it around being so-called pro-life. Yes. Um, but that pro-life, of course, uh, uh, was not defined in terms of you know uh, what women said would be good. Uh, to you know, encourage the life that uh, that they uh, bring into the world through their bodies, and they're often you know more directly responsible for um, uh, in terms of uh, you know childcare and uh, and other things. Um, but rather, it became this way of sort of uh, you know weaponizing the abortion debate uh, to really uh, build power for uh, men. Who were opposed to the changes that were uh, happening in the um, in the Congress at the time? I mean, you got to remember this came right on the heels of the uh, Civil Rights Act in the United States, the Voting Rights Act, which you know expanded the electorate, and and really critically the Immigration and Nationalization Act, which overturned the explicitly white supremacist um, immigration policy that the United States had had. And it was, it was those things that the politicians saw and recognized were going to change the demographics of the country in such a way that you know, white supremacy couldn't just be the kind of default of American democracy anymore. White folks were not gonna have uh, as easy a time um, uh, you know, pretending that every voice matters when there were uh, fewer and fewer white voices in the mix when um, democratic elections went forward. So that was the real anxiety that grew out of this. And uh, a lot of the culture wars have been cultivated as a way of um, exciting the white base uh, without, without speaking directly to uh, race issues or, or you know, even sometimes speaking directly to um, patriarchy or you know, uh, male dominance, but rather saying that your values are, yeah. are being threatened. Um, and that's, I think, what's happened with the so-called pro-life movement in this country. Although they're getting more explicit, though. Eh? Like, I mean, if you listen to Tucker Carlson now, he's just said he just comes out and says, you know, the more of these brown people we let in, 
Uh, yeah. the, you know, we're changing the electorate is the way he says it, you know, like those are, those are democratic voters. And so they don't vote for Republicans, you know, yada, yada. There's these, all these assumptions are made, of course, but they're yeah. basically saying immigration is, is a, is like a strategy to take away quote unquote, our rights, whoever the hour is in that, you know, it's shocking, but. Well, it's, uh, it's clarifying. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. But it's I think it's important. It's especially important for Christians to realize that this is not new. This is, um, I mean, if, if Carlson or Trump or others are, are more uh, direct in the way they say it, uh, this is nevertheless what people have been telling us for 40 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, to the extent that we have uh, believed that, you know, this is a Christian agenda, that, th that these are biblical values. Uh, I really do think we have um, uh, some some repentance work to do, and that we need these voices that I'm trying to lift up in Revolution yes, of yes. Values, and that the Poor People's Campaign is trying to lift up. We need these voices to teach us uh, how to hear Jesus in this moment, because the voices that are crying out for justice, I think, are the voices through which God is speaking to us. Amen. So to, just to sort of take that then into the next bit, uh, sometimes we like to have a section read from a book. And if you'd indulge us, I've included a little thing here for you to add. It's, it's near the end of the book. And it sort of picks up where we started in a way in that you, you've, you've been in Strom Thurmond's office and, and you move on with your ambitions. And we hear about your return from that and, and, uh, and Reverend uh, William Barber. So a little bit about that. And I'll have a question on the other side, if you would. Sure, this is from the final chapter of the book. After I left Strom Thurmond's office and my ambitions to climb the ladder of the religious right, I went to Germany as a young ambassador of the United States through an exchange program that the State Department had overseen since World War II. I spent that year learning what we mean when we remember the Holocaust and say never again. As I listened to stories about the rise of the Nazi party in the 1930s and met people who had been recruited into the Hitler Union as preteens, I realized how something that seemed so obviously evil in my history classes had been presented as a righteous good by fascist Christians. Mm. An elder in the community where I lived broke down in tears as he described to me the pride he felt saluting Hitler and standing up for his nation as a 12-year-old boy. Mm. The swastika at the center of the flag of the Hitler Union was a Christian cross, he reminded me. When he and his friends marched in nationalist parades, they thought they were doing their Christian duty and if they had been old enough, he knew, they would have done their part to deliver Jewish neighbors to the ovens. Mm -hmm. Woe to you teachers, Jesus says, to all who use a, quote, biblical worldview to cover for systems that exploit the poor, ignore the cries of the oppressed, and reduce the gospel to something that challenges human hearts, but not our public life. Mm -hmm. On the outside, you appear to people as righteous, Jesus says, but on the inside, you're full of hypocrisy. And wickedness. Jesus reserves his sharpest rebuke for religious leaders who deploy a false moral narrative to cover for the wickedness of leaders who abuse power and execute policy violence in public life. In this, Jesus does not depart from his people's tradition, but rather fulfills it. You will kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, Jesus says, tears in his eyes. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. If we live in a world scarred by wickedness, there's hope that God might gather us in love and change what is into what ought to be. But if the people charged with gathering us around scripture sell out its message, where will we turn for hope? It's the question that burned like fire in the bones of every biblical prophet. Mm -hmm. It's the question I found myself asking when I reached the dead end of the way the religious right taught me and found myself crying with a former Nazi. Mm. This is very powerful stuff. You go on to say, Jonathan, that you were not alone in feeling that way. You discovered that God had not abandoned you, uh, but that you simply needed new teachers. And you write about uh, Reverend William Barber that way. Um, and you've said some about, about uh, that earlier. I wonder if you can speak more about, and you've talked about this in terms of Abraham and, and, and others as well, about sort of fusion of and coalition of things. But that, um, as we hear Reverend Barber and, and yourself talk about moral fusion politics mm -hmm. and about, um, because, you know, I, the, the images that have, um, 
you know, Charleston of, you know, uh, of, of Nazis really marching in the streets, you know, neo-Nazis with Jews will not replace us. And it, it's, it's startling, you know, and you're right. The richer bombers of the world tell us that we should not be surprised by this because this has been building over, over decades now as, as people who have racist tendencies get us there. And we're not very far removed from this stuff. Like it's so easy to get there. And so I just wonder if you can share a little more about, uh, you know, about Reverend Barber and the work of moral fusion politics and what's happened coming out of that experience of knowing that we're all just a hair away from that stuff, you know? Yeah. Well, I think we, a lot of this continues because we've uh, tried to look away from it. Mm. Uh, James Baldwin said, not everything that is faced can be changed but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Mm -hmm. And I guess my greatest hope right now is that uh, in particular, since the riot at the Capitol here on January 6th, mm -hmm. there has been um, more conversation within our churches about the uh, influence of Christian nationalism and the way that, um, that this very well-funded and very aggressive movement has increasingly encroached on uh, what, I think honestly to most people, what matters most to them, their, their faith. Um, I, I'm not uh, in writing this and in the teaching and preaching that I do, I'm not in any way questioning the authenticity of authenticity of people's faith. I, I, I know people who believe this stuff and I know that they're true believers, true in the sense that they really do believe it. Um, but I also know that there is this capacity for our uh, true belief to become distorted and to even be uh, deployed towards ends that are uh, absolutely the opposite of what God intends. I think that's what, you know, that prophetic tradition that I was writing about there is all mm -hmm. about. It's all through scripture. This is not, this should not surprise us, right? No, right. Um, over and over again, God's people are, are led astray when uh, uh, biblical teachers, the teachers of the tradition, uh, form alliances with corrupt political leaders and uh, and the prophets call us to uh, uh, to repent and they call us to listen to uh, the people who are being hurt uh, Ezekiel is a great example of this he says you know your your politicians are like wolves you know they're, they're just tearing the people apart they're literally ripping their flesh apart uh, but he says you know your your religious leaders are right there whitewashing it right there you know blessing it as it's happening yeah. um, so that's that that is our tradition that's the scriptures we've been given. Uh, we're not better than those who came before us. We, we should know that we're susceptible to these same things, but we have to uh, face that reality and we have to be willing to repent. And when we repent, what I'm, what I'm trying to hold up as hope here in this, in this uh, book is that there are teachers. There are teachers who uh, have been uh, among us and uh, who, who've often been um, uh, unknown to us, but yet uh, often, you know, very close, maybe right down the street from where you are. Uh, pe people who uh, read the same scripture, uh, sing the same gospel hymns, and yet come to uh, a very different vision for what it means to live out our faith in public life. And uh, Reverend Barber was certainly uh, uh, one of my early teachers and has, has continued to be a, a teacher and a colleague and a friend in this journey all along. But um, but I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to suggest that uh, he's something exceptional, right? Uh, right. Uh, he is a great preacher, if you've ever heard him preach. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah, I, yeah. I, I'll, give, I'll give him credit where credit's due, <laughs> yeah. but that's not exceptional. It, that, that is the heart of the tradition. Um, uh, I don't know exactly when this is going to air, but just this week as we're recording it, uh, Pope Francis, you know, uh, shared this message yes. where he said, look, this is the gospel. The gospel says that um, uh, people have dignity and deserve the fruit of their labor. People deserve to have a place to live. People yeah. deserve to be treated right. And, uh, and he said, you know, shame on you corporations, shame on you governments, shame on you pharmaceutical companies that are trying to exploit people for your own gain, Amen. because that is uh, an attack on God and God's image in these yeah. people. Yeah. I mean, that's, Amen. that's Amen. the gospel, yeah, absolutely. The, yeah. the, 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 whether it comes from the Pope or, yeah, Reverend yeah. Barber or, you know, the, the, the person down the street from you, um, it's the heart of the gospel. And I think we have an opportunity to really lean into and learn, relearn that gospel. Uh, and that that is 
good news for the world. I think, uh, you know, one thing that we can see, even in the numbers, is that the impact of this Christian nationalism on churches in the United States has been a mass exodus of young people who have grown up uh, in, in, in this culture that's been cultivated. Uh, people just don't want uh, anything to do with uh, the church that has bought into these culture wars. Mm -hmm. And so the fastest growing religious group in the United States for four decades now, for the exactly the same period that this concerted effort has been happening, has been uh, the group of people who, who don't affiliate with the uh, religious tradition that they grew up in. Um, but we also have data now that says, uh, this just came out last week, uh, there's new data in the United States that says uh, almost two-thirds of people uh, who were surveyed uh, under 26 years old said that um, uh, in the last year, um, one of their uh, uh, most uh, uh, identifiable acts of worship was a, a protest that they attended. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so yeah. I mean, the, the, there's a real sense that people are connecting uh, the cry for justice with uh, faith and with their spirituality and with you know th this is a, a way that we can hear God's voice in a way that we can connect with God and I, I think that that is an opportunity for the church to see that this is where the Holy Spirit is at work and if we if we want to be part of God's good news and if we want to see the church flourish um, and and give uh, life to another generation uh, we need to be part of listening to these voices right. well that's interesting yeah. because i think it drew jackson rob who we had on here his book uh, yeah. god god speaks through wombs and i think rob, rob asked him you know to speak of some of his exemplars or to people he looks to and his answer was i look to the young people who are out in the streets uh yeah. marching for black lives matter marching right. against border issues march he said those are my prophetic voices like those are yeah. the voices they may not have been in a church in the last 10 years but they're out in the street in a yeah. religious act using their feet as prophecy. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, local congregations. Um, uh, yes. This is, what is this called? Vickers Crossing? Yeah. I assume yeah. you've got some vickers who listen yeah. to this. There's two, well, there's at least two vickers on it. <laughs> there's, at least two, there's at least two vickers. Well, let me talk to you two. Okay. I think a vicar, you know, in a parish who yeah. gathers people for worship every week has a great opportunity to see what God is doing out there, to see, you know, that there are people crying out for a living wage. There are people crying out that Black Lives Matter. There are people crying out for climate justice and say, that is indeed God speaking. Amen. And if we gather around the word of God Amen. on Sunday morning and we read the scriptures and we read the prayers, then we could also invite some of those voices into the church. You know, Amen. we could have a testimony from the climate activists or from the uh, uh, racial justice activists, bring them right into worship yeah, and right. say, look, you, you might not worship like we do, but we want to hear what you have to say because we think it's part of what God's doing in the world. Exactly. Amen, exactly. Amen to that. Amen yeah. to that. Yep. Thank you. That's perfect. Hey, Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove is our guest today. The book is Revolution of Values. Uh, we will have a link. There it is for those watching YouTube on Kevin's wall, but we'll have a link to it in our on our website to thevickerscrossing.com so you can find it that way as well. So, hey, Jonathan, thanks so much for spending the time with us today and for your, your work, your ministry, and your voice. And I know our listeners uh, will be learning a lot. We certainly have today. And and we certainly appreciate you spending the time with us. Thanks so much. It's a joy to be with you. Bless Thank him. you so much. Thank you, Jonathan. Again, once again, Jonathan Wilson awesome. Hartgrove. The book is Revolution of Values. And it was great to talk to him today. Amazing work and, uh, he's doing with uh, Reverend William Barber, who we mm. still hope to get on the podcast. One of these yep. days, we'll have a drum roll for him. Uh, right. But uh, good work he's doing uh, with the Poor People's Campaign. Excellent stuff, Jonathan. Good. And thank you, guys. Always good to chat. Thank you to our sponsors today in the Vickers Crossing, to A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London Middlesex, both family-owned and operated. Deadly. Hyde Park Care Pharmacy, Hyde Park Care Pharmacy, locally owned, locally operated, locally loved, and to Molly Maid, make your home a healthy haven, call Molly Maid London today. That's clean. And that, that's clean, man. I always finish clean. Um, that wraps it up today on the Vickers Crossing. Where am I going with that? <laughs> and uh, it's Rob Henderson from Holy Trinity St. Stephen's. I'm out of here. Kevin George here from St. Aidan's Church. I'm clean, I'm drugged, and I'm ready for the funeral. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Ian. I think I should maybe not get drugged. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, thanks, guys. I think that maybe we've had enough for today. Uh, yeah, right, that's good. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll talk to you next time in the Vickers Crossing. And remember, Kevin, to always look both ways, my friend. Before you cross that street. Oh, yeah. Thank you for listening. Our hosts are Kevin George and Rob Henderson. Our producer and composer is myself, Ian, with original artwork done by Elizabeth Dodman. If you have any questions or want to know where to find us, tweet us at Vickers Crossing or find us on Facebook at The Vickers Crossing. If you have any other questions about anything heard on this podcast, leave us a comment or look in the description to find out more. Thanks!